It's an honor to be with you today to talk about narrative therapy as a model for Christian counseling. For a moment, let's talk about weaving. Weaving is amongst the most ancient of crafts in the world. In times gone by, woven fabrics were a way of sharing stories, history, and meaning. In essence, the craft of weaving creates a piece of fabric through a combination of warp and weft. The lengthwise or longitudinal warp yarns are held stationary in tension on a frame or a loom, whilst the transverse weft is drawn through and inserted over and under the warp. And working together, the warp and the weft weave something new. I'd like to suggest that the Christian discipline of practical theology, the ministry of pastoral care, and narrative therapy together weave a narrative of care for those God loves and those we serve. On the one hand, we hold the steadfast longitudinal thread or the warp of pastoral care or practical theology tied to the loom, which is our Christian faith and which holds the weave firm. An important aspect of the practice of pastoral care is, as the Right Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Larty from Ghana suggests, to encourage people to make sense of their experiences to disclose Christian meaning in life and to encourage people to engage in their own conversation with the Christian tradition. In the other hand, we hold the threads, the weft, which represents the ideas and practices of narrative therapy. Narrative therapy refers primarily to the ideas and practices of Michael White and David Epstein, as well as others who have built upon their work. Now, Michael White holds that narrative therapy is less of an approach and should be considered a worldview, an epistemology, a philosophy, a personal commitment, a politics, a practice, a life. Professor Laura Burrs, Associate Professor at King's University College in Canada, believes that narrative therapy addresses faith and spirituality in practice through offering a respectful, non-judgmental and non-directed approach to working with issues relating to spirituality and meaning making. And so for the past 21 years, I have continued to learn to weave these threads together, the ministry of partial care and the ideas and practices of narrative therapy into what I call a narrative of care. And unfortunately, whilst time doesn't allow for an in-depth look at the practices of narrative therapy that we can weave into practical theology, if I may, I'll briefly share what I consider to be three significant ideas for a collaborative narrative of care. And they are the practice of hospitality, the importance of stories, and giving voice to the marginalized. Firstly, let's talk about the practice of hospitality. Henry Nowens writes this about hospitality. To be hospitable is to create a free space where the stranger can enter and become a friend instead of an enemy. Hospitality is not to change people, but to offer them space where change can take place. It is not to bring men and women over to our side but to offer freedom not disturbed by dividing lines. It is not to lead our neighbor into a corner where there are no alternatives left, but to open a wide spectrum of options for choice and commitment. I think that Henry Nowen's understanding of hospitality, which he wrote in 1972, is essential for the formation of any pastoral or therapeutic relationship. Narrative therapist Jodi Anand offers us the image of the therapist as host in her article of the same name. And so the role of the pastoral carer, the listener or counsellor is to create an environment in which people can tell their stories, 
feel their pain and their joy, and then discover their competencies and their faith in God, who is the author and the finisher of all our stories. Carrie Doringer, a professor of pastoral care at Denver University, speaks of empowering people as an essential ingredient of pastoral care and the importance of trusting the pastoral counselor not to impose religious and spiritual practices and meaning upon them. So pastoral conversations then are for the purpose of alleviating suffering in persons and almost to facilitate the healing power of God through stories created during the conversation in the presence of the Holy Spirit. So in this way, the counselor enters the conversation without a specific agenda for the conversation, but almost as a way of becoming the embodied incarnational presence of Christ for others. Now, the thread of hospitality cannot be separated from the following aspects. Firstly, the positioning of the counselor. So narrative therapy holds a counselor to a decentered but influential position. And this means reflecting on the power dynamics in the relationship, taking responsibility for the therapeutic process, and asking questions that do not lead, direct, or infer expert knowledge. This also means being aware of the values that scaffold hospitality towards another, and those are respect, not making assumptions, not judging, curiosity, and really being present to the other person. Another one is noticing the little sacraments of daily existence. Noticing the little sacraments of daily existence. Quite significant. This is a term used by the co-founder of narrative therapy, Michael White. And the intention is to remind us to be open to those little events in people's lives that can evoke a sense of the significant or of the sacred. Those little everyday occurrences can often be overlooked, perhaps because they are the sort of events that mainstream culture does not particularly value. Another important aspect of hospitality is the practice of listening. Listening without the intention to respond, give advice, or try to lead, direct, or fix someone is one of the greatest gifts a pastoral counselor can offer. Listening is not just hearing what the other party in the conversation has to say. Listening means taking a vigorous human interest in what is being told us. Poet Alice Dewar Miller writes that you can listen like a blank wall or like a splendid auditorium where every sound comes back fuller and richer. I love that. You can listen like a blank wall or like a splendid auditorium where every sound comes back fuller and richer. Have you ever wondered what Jesus might be teaching us about levels of listening in the parable of the sower in Luke 8 verses 5 to 15? So just as we need to have hearts prepared to listen to God like the good soil, so our quality of listening to others needs to be deepened our ears and hearts prepared and ready to hear. In this instance, the depth of our listening can be likened to the different soils. So for example, seeds on the path could be likened to barely listening, kind of surface listening, where our half listen paying scant attention. Or perhaps where the focus is actually on me and I can only listen to your words with a view to have something to say. If we think about seeds amongst rocks and thorns as shallow listening, I may appear to listen, but I'm hearing your words and not your feelings. I'm not making an effort to understand more fully, to take your words deeper into myself. 
And then we have the image of seed on good soil, which represents in-depth listening, where I'm really putting myself in your position and seeing things from your point of view. I am acknowledging and responding to you and not being distracted. I won't pass judgment on you or try to correct you or sort you out. And so the focus really is on you, the sharer of the story. I'd like to suggest that another thread, which is significant, is story. Stories have the power to shape our reality in that they construct and constitute who we believe ourselves to be, what we see, feel, and do. And the stories we live with grow out of conversations brought about in relational, social, cultural, and religious contexts. The idea that we live multi-storied lives is a familiar one in narrative therapy. Through the teachings of Michael White and David Epstein and others like Jill Friedman and Jean Coombs and Alice Morgan, we use language in narrative therapy such as the single story, the problem-saturated story, the dominant story, the alternative story. We talk about restorying and thickening preferred stories. And so in context, stories help us make meaning of the world around us, connect our past to our present, and serve as a guide for the future. It's also the telling of stories which forms part of the fabric of pastoral work. Dr. Roberta Bondi, Professor Emerita at Candler School of Theology at Emory University says that pastoral work is about the messy particularities of everyday lives examined with excruciating care and brought into conversation with the great doctrines of the Christian faith. The messy particularities of everyday lives examined with excruciating care and brought into conversation with the great doctrines of the Christian faith. I find myself really struck by these words. Now, narrative therapy pay, pays particular attention to stories in the midst of dominant cultural discourses. In the South African context, the desire to restory many of the narratives of apartheid and the disempowerment of the past have been collaborated with the help of narrative ideas. Doctors Dirk Kotzer and Almarie Kotzer, responsible for introducing narrative therapy to South Africa, state that daily encounters with suffering, hunger, malnutrition, unemployment, rage and anger, crime, violence, rape, all these issues are not extraordinary, sadly but ordinary to many people, counselors, caregivers, and pastoral therapists in South Africa. And the Reverend Trevor Hudson speaks of how stories allow us a personal encounter with the pain of our shattered and fragmented community. Stories have the power to shape our reality in that they construct and constitute what we see, feel, and do. The stories we live with grow out of conversations brought about in relational, social, cultural and religious contexts. And the point of the story is an invitation to the counsellor to participate in and witness the unfolding of the story. And when we do so, we're almost walking into the space into which the voice of God breaks in fresh ways. Pastoral care or counselling, therefore, also creates space to discover God's presence in our human stories. Ordinary life is transformed when we recognize that our stories bear the presence of God. A third common thread for us to consider is that of giving voice to the marginalized. Narrative therapy takes a strong ethical stance against marginalized, disempowered individuals and groups whose stories stand apart from the dominant stories and discourses of our cultures and societies. 
narrative therapy uses a practice of deconstruction as a way of undoing systems of meaning by questioning that which is taken for granted or dominant. We just have to look to scripture to see stories of Jesus, Jesus and recognize that he was an agent of social and political change as he engaged with injustice, inequality, oppression and cruelty in the social world of his day. Jesus engaged the marginalized in society and deconstructed power positions in the dominant dis discourse of religious experts holding power over all God's people. In Matthew 23, verse 25, we read, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. So deconstruction offers us a way to explore the taken for granted ideas of church, of doctrine, of actions, and of privilege and power that limit people's well-being. In this way, there is a common thread between narrative therapy and liberation theology, as both nurture ways of resistance against oppressive or exploitative discourse and practices. In closing, then, the narrative emphasis on listening to the multi-storied lives of God's beloveds, stories of past and present, and the anticipation of the alternative story, which draws on the person's survival strengths and ability to overcome, is aligned with scripture's invitation to embrace God's extravagant and reckless love. A God who knows sorrow, grief, betrayal and death, and yet has turned these into a story of grace, love, joy, and life. He is the God of the alternative story. May I suggest that narrative therapy offers us a deeply meaningful way of doing theology and of living out the commissions of the scriptures. Thank you. Cool. The a profound moments to be able to hear her her presentation today, um, specifically the idea that our stories bear the presence of God. I think that is really, really profound. Clifford, welcome and thank you so much for being here today. I know you've had the privilege of working directly with and being taught by Nicole Dixon herself. So I know that your narrative ideas are quite um, on par with, with what we would love to discuss today. Perhaps you could just start by sharing a little bit about your initial engagement with narrative therapy. All right. Thank, thank you so much, Candida, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, it is a huge blessing and privilege for me to be part of this conversation, focusing on something that I'm very passionate about. <clears throat> and I would also like to thank uh, Nicole for laying down um, a very solid substratum or foundation for this conversation. Um, I would like to, if you would allow me to share just a very short story about the ex experience that I encountered a number of years ago. It was a few days before my best friend's wedding. And as we were driving around trying to put the logistics together, we found ourselves involved in a head-on collision in a car accident with a 30-ton truck. And it was on along a bridge. And those who were driving behind us told us that they saw our car being flipped up meters into the air. Then it settled on the mud uh, of, uh, along the riverbed, which was under the bridge. So in that accident, I suffered injuries to my back. But my friend, 
uh, who's an Anglican priest, by the way, and his fiance, who's now his wife, uh, were in the front seats. My friend was the one who was driving. So his fiance um, suffered extensive injuries to the head and she was bleeding. So as we're crying out for help to those people who were passing by over that road, what surprised us was the people were just looking at us. The best they could do was take out their phones and switch on their phones, taking videos and pictures, but they were not helping us out. And my friend's fiance was, was bleeding. I found that very traumatic, but God being God, we ended up to, uh, carrying her to where we could get help. And she was admitted in, in the ICU. But finally, they, they did manage to uh, go ahead with their wedding because they were planning a wedding. And I suffered a lot of trauma because of that. And it took me a while for me to get over it. But as we're having conversations and living through that experience, there is something that I managed to take note of as I was talking to my, to my friend about it. There is a little bit of detail in the narrative as we were looking at the story, it, looking at the events that happened. There is something that came out of that conversation, and I remember it so vividly, that by the time, just before the, the collision in that accident, I could feel something, a power that was holding me. I don't know what it is up to now. But I could just feel something telling me that you are safe and nothing is going to happen to you. And even in that accident, I've never felt so safe in my life. And I attribute that it can only be God who was speaking to me. But that little detail is so important that it changed my life and how I view Jesus. So now I am who I am now because of that, it's a little event that happened. It was just a matter of about 15 or so seconds, but it has changed my life and it is, I am who I am now because of that. So that's how powerful stories can be. So it is important for us to listen when, when someone is telling their story because they are giving you an insight into, into their life. So that's how important it is. Thank you for that um, introduction. And I can also see then how, as we heard the weaving idea from, um, from Nicole earlier, that there are different weaves that are coming together. And so to be able to unpack those weaves, to be able to see which parts of the story have perhaps been forgotten, that it starts to help in the traumatic um, space. I know we'll look at that a little bit more, but later on in the conversation. But maybe for now, Clifford, would you mind sharing how you feel that narrative counseling fits into the broader Christian counseling space? Thank you, Candida. Thank you, Candida. I humbly submit that we cannot have, we any, cannot conversation have any conversation about Christian counseling without inviting the minds and the thoughts of those involved in the conversation to appreciate that Jesus Christ the healer is our point of reference and from whom our mandate emanates from. It is from this standpoint that we can confidently discuss the effectiveness of any one of the numerous Christian counseling modalities available for use to share love and bring healing to the people of God. St. Paul in his letter to the Galatians, chapter 6, verse 2, gives a directive to all Christians to carry each other's burdens. And in doing so, we'll be fulfilling the law of Jesus Christ, who is the law of love. Currently, Africa is a continent, whilst it is still recovering from the devastating effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, is faced by a plethora of challenges, which include rising cost of living, hunger, poverty, forced migration, rising prevalence of violence against women and children, just to name a few 
The Mental Health Federation of South Africa reports that more than 17 million people here in South Africa are dealing with depression, substance abuse, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. The Department of Health spends only 4% of its budget on addressing this issue. God's word is about love and healing. So it is our obligation as Christian counselors to communicate that healing and that love across the whole spectrum of different cultures and genres in Africa, especially in the face of the numerous challenges affecting individuals and families alike. As we hear Jesus saying to his disciples that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. That's Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 to 38. So are we being reminded of the daunting task that we're faced with as counselors? British philosopher Crispin Wright describes counseling as being essentially a relationship and not a technique or skill. Therefore, narrative therapy as a modality is a good fit into that space. Yeah, no, I hear you. Um, and I wonder then a little bit if you could perhaps share that. What is narrative therapy? I know Nicole touched on it, but perhaps you can also bring it in now. So having said what you just said, what is narrative therapy? Narrative therapy is an effective approach of helping clients become healthy, flourishing people in the midst of difficult and dysfunctional situations. Its reliance on foundational assumptions, such as using stories as a mechanism for developing, and an emphasis on the communal aspect of meaning making, causes it to be an attractive tool for Christian counselors. Narrative therapy was originally developed in the 1980s by Australian therapist Michael White and his colleague, New Zealand therapist David Epstein, Influenced by the French theorist Michael Foucault, White and Epstein aimed to create a therapeutic theoretical model that challenged the social constructs under which individual lives, under which individuals live their lives. Thus, narrative therapy was born. It is a social construct, constructivist approach in which reality is constructed by social interactions and processes. Narrative therapy is based on the premise that we story and create the meaning of life events using available dominant discourses. People experience problems when personal life does not fit these dominant societal discourses and expectations. In essence, identity is relational. According to this model, life is a series of stories that follows a plot and is created through interactions with others. The narrative and the interpretation of the narrative influence thinking, feeling, and behavior. It is therefore unwise to ignore a person's story because it shapes their reality. A famous American poet by the name of Maya Angelou once said, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you. In his book, Anatomy of the Soul, Kurt Thompson explains that you construct your understanding of the world and your space in it through the lens of your own story and the manner and context in which you reflect on your story or tell your story becomes part of the fabric of the narrative itself. In other words, the process of reflecting on and telling others your story and the way you experience others hearing it actually shapes the story and the neural correlates or networks it represents. This is how much power a story carries. Mm. 
An initial goal of narrative therapy is to better understand how a key problem viewed by the client within existing life story influences or impacts our life. So you're actually saying that the very telling of the story and how one responds to what they're hearing is already starting to shape how a client might view their problems and even start to experience the God story within their own story. I mean, it's quite a responsibility for the counselor to, to kind of understand how, when, and what part of the story to even explore. I mean, there must be some skills in there somewhere, but how would we know which stories to engage as, as Christian counselors? What I would say is the first most important thing that must not be overlooked is that us as Christian counselors, we must be prayerful so that we, the Holy Spirit can give us that discerning spirit as we listen to the client's story. Goldberg and Goldberg explain that our sense of reality is organized and maintained through the stories by which we circulate knowledge about ourselves and the world we inhabit. So according to the narrative therapy model, life is a series of stories that follow a plot. Stories are created through interaction with others. We think of our stories as dominant or alternative discourses. The dominant discourse is the story a client tells about his or her life. White and Epstein speak of the dominant story of ourselves that is created through collaboration of culture, community, family, and oneself. This dominant story creates meaning, explanations, and understanding of all the interactions. It is the overarching narrative that may involve problematic symptoms that may include things like depression and anxiety. Within the dominant discourse, there are loose ends and pieces which do not fit in the total story of oneself and one's life. So in trying to maintain cohesiveness, these pieces are often discarded or altered. Okay, so if I can understand you, there's, these, there's an alternative discourse, an alternative story, and it's made up of pieces. And sometimes these pieces that are either discarded or altered, I mean, are they lost? Are they gone forever? Or are these parts merely maybe tainted by the problem or somehow separated from, from the problem? Is, is there somehow another part to the story that can be engaged? Okay. The alternative discourse is one that, that does not conform to the dominant plot. It is the preferred story that the therapist and the client will be cultivating through the therapy process. One of the main primary objectives of narrative therapy is to empower the client and make them understand that they are the expert of their own lives and not the therapist. This helps to break the power dynamic that develops from the notion that the therapist is the expert and has to come up with all the solutions. According to White and Epstein, narrative therapy postulates that solutions are to be found in the lives and relationships of the clients and not in the head of the therapist. The therapist's task is one of facilitating the reauthoring of some of the aspects of the client's life. Through a collaborative counseling process, narrative therapists actively help clients reauthor their stories, thicken their identities, and ultimately construct new pathways for the future. So, so Clifford, if I can ask you this, if if solutions are part of the client's internal makeup, so between them and God, and it's not the therapists, uh, both you and Nicole both mentioned this decentered but influential space. But I'm wondering a little bit, why would counselees or clients even come to see a counsellor in the first place if their solutions are already within them? That's a very good question, Candida. 
The stories that clients offer are problem saturated and their perception is clouded by their problem dominant story. It is through narrative therapy that intervention that the previously dominant problem saturated story becomes obsolete and alternative and more rewarding and helpful stories are identified and generated. These alternative stories enable performance of new, more open-minded meanings, which harness the client's personal sense of agency. Therefore, narrative therapy is essentially a process of deconstructing unhelpful stories and co-constructing improved stories in a context of consensual meaning making and transformation which requires a context on adventure and discovery. The process of deconstruction is facilitated by the use of questions, which helps the client to trace the effects of the dominant discourse. It allows the client to describe the problem in detail and give it a name. So especially us as Christians, sometimes the devil wants sometimes us to focus devil. more on the on the problem and not focus on the goodness on the of So that is what we should be mindful of. So there is a perception that's, that's out there um, with regards to narrative therapy, perhaps you could help us with it, that to consider an alternative story is to ignore the problem. Or, or some counselors may be worried about clients not taking responsibility for the sin in their life um, that they may or may not um, that may or may not be behind the problem. Could you perhaps help us understand this externalization tool and how it helps take responsibility not only for the problem but for the solution too? The technique of externalizing the problem is quite central to the narrative therapy. Clients are invited to objectify the problem and sometimes personify the problem. This can be done by giving it a name. Just for an example, depression must, might be called Mr. Depression, which dislodges them from the fixed static world of problems being intrinsic to themselves and their relationships. What is enlightening about this technique is that when a problem is personified and given a name, it becomes easier to describe. And with the use of further questions, it is possible to dissect and analyze it further. So externalizing, externalization conversations can be flexible and creative. You can even ask the client to draw how this problem looks like, because some clients are bet better express themselves through pictures. So you can afford them that opportunity to draw a picture of how they see the problem. And the problem can be collaboratively discussed, which brings with it a feeling of relief on the client, like a weight has been lifted off their shoulders. For instance, when working with a young child who wants to stop getting into so much trouble, the externalizing question would be, how does Mr. Mischief manage to trick you? That's how you'd ask the child. Or when is Mr. Mischief most likely to visit? Through these sorts of questions, some space is created between the person and the problem. And this enables the person to revise their relationship with the problem. So once problems are externalized, they can be put into a storyline. So placing problems in storylines can begin to shed more light on how they have come to have such a big influence on someone's life. So it can also begin to provide people with a, a lot of information and richer understandings of how they might be able to reclaim their lives from the influence of the problems. Okay, I think I'm starting to understand it a bit better from your perspective. I do enjoy narrative work, so I've explored it a little bit. And I can start to see now this, this way of externalizing and, like you said, these other tools, writing a letter or drawing a picture, um, that it becomes the power balancing that we're looking for. The client starts to take responsibility. They're able to see it for what it is 
when it is metaphorically speaking outside of themselves um I, I like the idea of relief and responsibility dovetailing or working together. Um, I think I think it's sometimes hard for many of us Christian counselors to find a way to engage the issue of sin. Um, often we we slip into spaces of looking for the sin as the reason behind the problem, um, which obviously it is. Sin is the the reason behind every problem, but it may not be that person's sin. It could be somebody else's sin against them or the fact that we're in a fallen world. So this externalization, perhaps this could be a way for us to consider problems, sin um, with the clients in their God image bearing design collaboratively, like you said, non-blaming, non-judgmental, coming alongside as we heard last week, so that we can start to look and see and consider the effects and it, I hear you, it works with children, it works with adults um, to be able to look at problems from this perspective um, and what the problem maybe is taking from them and from their God design as a person. So I guess perhaps you could share just a tiny bit more that the aim behind this, I mean, we've kind of said it, but perhaps you could elaborate a bit more, this aim of externalizing practices, maybe a little bit more clearly for us, because it seems quite profound. I think the, the, the substratum is we are all created in the image and the likeness of God. I think that's a very good, good foundation that we can um, put it on. Then the aim of externalizing practices is for people to realize that they, they and the problem are not the same thing. According to Kerry and Russell, problems are understood to have been socially constructed over time. They go on to postulate that when it is understood that people's relationships with problems are shaped by history and culture, it is possible to explore how gender, race, culture, sexuality, class, and other relations of power have influenced the construction of the problem. So by giving consideration to the dynamics that have uh, influenced the construction of the pro by considering by giving consideration to the dynamics involved in the shaping of identity, it becomes possible to enable new understandings of life that are influenced less by self-blame, more by an awareness of how our lives are shaped by broader cultural stories. Problems like anxiety, depression, and mischief can be externalized and personified so that they can be analyzed further. So when problems are externalized and the person no longer believes that they are the problem, this opens the door to exploring their competencies and skills and the ways of addressing the effects of the problem. So externalizing conversations are a doorway to preferred stories and all the delightful skills and ideas and knowledge that people have. The process, this process that we're speaking of, as it unfolds, uh, and the client perhaps becomes less blinded by the dominant story of the problem, is it possible that they might be able to begin to see, to remember the ex or experience perhaps the parts of themselves that are still well, um, still capable or still connected to the work of the Spirit of God? Um, I'm thinking along the lines of the Spirit of God always being alive, always being at work and well, always active in the lives of all of humanity. So when we're blinded by our dominant discourses or dominant problems, we're not able to really engage that. Um, and we move away from it. Uh, like we said, we might be blinded by, by sin, you know, blinded to what the spirit of God is doing. Our sin, other sin, yet he's still busy. So I'm wondering, could clients better be able to see what God is doing and calling them to, reminding them of, if they are less blinded by these dominant problem saturated stories okay it is imperative to note that it is during externalizing conversations that therapists should be on the lookout for unique outcomes which are sometimes referred to as sparkling moments 
So unique outcomes refer to lived examples of either recent or past when the client resisted the, the usual response prescribed by the problem. So these sparkling moments can simply be defined as any times when the dominant of the problem disappears. If you're listening to the story that I was telling about what happened to me, the sparkling moment was when I did remember that feeling of being safe. So when the therapist notices one of these moments, that is an opportunity to explore what made this possible. It is skillful and specific questioning that elicit often subtle unique outcomes. So once the problem is externalized and began to generate through unique outcomes and an alternative story, then the other narrative practices like the use of therapeutic letters, documents and celebrations all become relevant. These other narrative practices are able to generate rich descriptions of the alternative stories of people's lives, which in turn lead to people being able to make significant changes to their lives. Uh, Clifford, I could almost hear the client's aha moment. You know, last week we spoke about the fatisma moment as we explored it um, in the paraclesis model. Um, as they start to remember their God image bearing design and responsibility, their hopes flooding back, um, their responsibility starting to engage again and finding that energy for life, um, for, for choosing. It would be difficult for a counselor to facilitate this, I would imagine, and not become wrapped up in the moment and start preaching, teaching, or, or kind of owning the moment for themselves. Is, I mean, have you found that? When clients reauthor their story re to reflect a more accurate understanding of who they are in relation to creation, other people, and God, they begin to understand narratives of failure in the context of redemption and hope, which empowers them and not paralyze them. So ultimately, by using narrative therapy as a framework to help clients integrate the revealed spiritual truth, truths in their lives, they begin to transform their situations. So it is imperative to note how narrative therapy places special emphasis and importance on the ability of the counselor or, or therapist to listen to the client with the values of respect, curiosity, non-judgment, non-assumption, transparency, and confidentiality. The importance of listening was beautifully expressed by Diedrich Bonhoeffer when he said, the service that one owes to others in the fellowship consists of listening to, to them. Just as love to God begins with listening to his word, so the beginning of love for the brethren is learning to listen to them. It is God's love for us that he not only gives us his word, but also lends us his ear. So it is his work that we do for our brothers and sisters when we learn to listen to them. Christians so often think that they must always contribute something when they are in the company of others. That is one service they have to render. They forget that listening can be a greater service than speaking. That's beautiful. Just as our Lord Jesus Christ in Mark 10, verses 46 to 52, compassionately heard the cry for help from blind Bartimaeus, he called him over and ministered to his need for healing and res restored his sight. So are we as Christian counselors being called to minister and bring healing to God's people? who are relentlessly crying out for help in our continent of Africa and the world at large. You know, we're talking about sharing stories, externalization, power balance, taking responsibility, empowering. Okay. So this all sounds very much like a praxis for Africa. 
considering our journey that we've been on, what you said in your introduction, um, and the journey we're on presently. And um, so how do you see narrative therapy or narrative therapeutic practices being one of the answers for Christian counseling in Africa, individuals working with groups? I mean, what's, what's being generated in your thinking at the moment? Narrative therapy doesn't say, I know more about your problems than you do, or I, I have the expert insight. What narrative practices do is they offer a safe language to look at problems together collaboratively from within our culture, even one culture to another. Groups of people working together to face a problem like racism, colonization, just to name a few, can invite all participants to the same side of the table and look at a problem using externalized language to safely explore the devastation, the effects, the longevity, longevity, the voice of the problem. Externalization offers us safe space to face problems interculturally, multiracially, within the church and the church with the world. I think narrative conversation speaks to unity in diversity and not sameness or uniformity, but unity. The fact that narrative therapy relies on the story to help individuals make meaning is quite powerful and reflects the way that scriptures assist Christians to do the same. Because narrative therapy does not rely on an individualistic approach to meaning, it parallels the communal aspect of the Christian faith. As Christians, we identify ourselves as part of God's people and inheritors of the story of salvation, not just individuals being saved one by one. We are individually saved, but grafted into the body of believers. Yeah, thanks for that, Clifford. I'm often wondering about how we reflect God to the world as the body of Christ, as a uh, what you mentioned, diverse, unity without uniformity. So we're not looking for sameness. We're looking for collaborative ways to reflect God to the world in a un with unity. And I'm wondering about narrative practices in that space because when we all get to sit on the same side of the table and put the problem, externalize it, put it on the other side of the table and say, well, how do we all see it? Let's look at it. Let's share how we see what's happening over there. It takes out a lot of the dynamics that could be quite damaging if it wasn't that way. And I'm wondering how that would play out um, as we go forward. So I'm looking forward to more conversations um, about this with you, specifically as we have um, added narrative um, as a model of practice in our honors degree. So we would like to start to see what find ways to more um, more beautifully respond reflect God to the world. So thank you for your contribution there. I really appreciate that. Clifford, you have been an absolute star today. Are there any closing statements you'd like to make before I hand over to our academic dean? No, I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity for the enriching conversation. I'm always passionate about narrative and through the questions and through the, the engagement and the conversation, I've immensely, I'm, I am immensely enriched. And I thank God for the opportunity and thank you, Candida, and the SAD uh, team for uh, setting this up. Uh, this symposium has been perfect. We thank God for that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.